Well, this morning, after four months, we've now arrived to the end of 1 Samuel. So we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 30 this morning. Now, next Sunday, because we're finishing 1 Samuel this morning, next Sunday, we move back to the New Testament. So remember, we're kind of flip-flopping, going through the Bible in order, verse by verse. We're going back to the New Testament. We're going to start our study in 2 Corinthians next Sunday. But this morning, again, we're going to finish 1 Samuel. We'll study both chapters 30 and 31. Now, with my travels and everything, it's kind of hard to remember where we were. So let's just remember, last time in our study, we saw David, who's the next king of Israel. What is he doing? He's living with the enemy. You remember that? He's been dwelling with the Philistines. And he wanted to go to war against Israel. But the Philistine rulers, you remember, they kicked him out and they said, no, you can't go to war with us. So now David, remember, at this point in his life is completely backslidden. He's rebellious against God and he's relying on his flesh. And all that, of course, leads to what? When we rely on the flesh, it leads to disastrous results. That's what we're going to see as we embark in chapter 30. The title of this morning's message is very simple. It's A Bitter End. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me one more time as we seek the Lord's blessing on his word? Lord, what an honor and a privilege it is to be able to open your word. And Lord, we're here not just because we're trying to check off some sort of religious box. Say, okay, God, now you owe me. I went to church. But Jesus, we're here because we want to draw near to you. We need to be more like you. And Lord, we believe that your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So Lord, we ask that you would do your work in our hearts through your word. For your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 So again, the Philistines have denied the Israelites, excuse me, the Philistines have denied David from fighting the Philistines. I am a mess. (laughs) slow down i'm too excited to be back up here david sided with the philistines trying to fight against the israelites and the philistines say david you can't do it so david remember he has 600 men 600 warriors who are with him so they've now been denied so what do they do they go back home so you can imagine as they make their way they're traveling probably about 20 to 25 miles a day back home. And their home, we know from previous studies at this point, was Ziklag. So they're on their way back home. They're weary. They're tired, full of disappointment, right? And look what happens. Verse 1, chapter 30. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire. So what happened is while David and his group of 600 men were trying to fight alongside the Philistines, what happened? They left their home base unprotected. And the wicked Amalekites seized the opportunity. Look at verse 2. And they had taken captive the women and those who were there, from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. Now, if you're taking notes, you may want to jot down chapter 27. Because here we see that the Amalekites, the wicked Amalekites, showed more mercy than David did. Because back in chapter 27, we learned what? That while David was living with the Philistines, remember, he was like a bandit. He would go to cities and rob them, take all their loot, and then kill everyone in the city. Do you remember that? Just nod your head and make me feel good, please, if you don't. David killed all those people, but the Amalekites didn't. They just simply take him as hostages. The Amalekites were more merciful than David. And it reminds us that it's always a terrible testimony for Christians when the world acts more Christ-like than we do. So I want you to just picture the scene before we move on as Soldiers, David and his men, were surely discouraged that they did not have the opportunity to fight against the Philistines. But they knew they were on their way home. And what does home mean? Home means familiar surroundings and family. 
But as they approach home, even far off in the distance, they knew something was wrong. They could see fire, but it wasn't normal fire from like cooking fires. No, the smoke would be far too black for that. And as they approached the city, I'm sure they wondered, hey, where's all their wives? Where's the kids? Why isn't anyone running to them, greeting them? They approach the city and all they hear is silence. And all they smell is the smell of destruction. So imagine the horror when they arrive to Ziklag and they see their city as a burnt out pile of rubble and none of their families are around. Can you picture the scene? Verse 3 through 6. So David and his men came to the city and there it was, burned with fire. And their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. Have you ever been there where sometimes there just aren't enough tears? That's where these guys are. Verse 5 and 6. And David's two wives, Ahinoam the Jezreelites and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed. For the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. And if you're taking notes, you may want to underline and star it. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. David has now lost everything, hasn't he? Even the 600 men who previously had shown complete and total loyalty and allegiance to him, What are they now doing? They're speaking of stoning David. You know what they're saying, right? David, this is all your fault that our families are kidnapped and our city has been destroyed. You and I have a term for this place that David is at right now. It's called rock bottom. But notice the end of verse 6. But David strengthened himself through the greatest motivational speaker. Is that what it says? No. No. He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Remember, this was rebellious David. This was backslidden David. This was wayward David. And yet, as David cries out to God, God shows him mercy and grace in David's time of need. Sometimes God will allow us to get to the point where we literally have nothing left to hold on to. Because only when our crutches are completely removed, we're so stubborn that it takes us to get to that point to where we finally cry out to God and say, God, I need you. And then he swoops right in. And folks, I hope you know that God does not do this because he's mean or he's vengeful or he takes joy in watching us hurt. No, he does it out of love. Verse 7 and 8. So David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. Now again, it's been a few weeks since we've been in this study. But remember, when David spent this time with the Philistines, what did we learn in the scriptures? He never mentions the Lord once, does he? But now, now that David has hit rock bottom, now that David has nothing left to try to hold on to and cling to, to try to work his way out of the situation, everything's taken away. What does David do? Number one, he strengthens himself in the Lord. Number two, what is he doing here? He's asking the Lord what to do next. He's seeking God. Remember, the ephod was a special apron that the priests would wear. We learned about this in our other studies in the Old Testament, right? And in the ephod, there were two stones, the Urim and the Thummim. And they were used at that time to seek or understand what the will of the Lord was. So why does David ask the priest for the ephod? David is asking God for his guidance. 
folks, for you and I today, we don't need the Urim and the Thummim. We have the Holy Spirit and we have God's word. Amen? This is what we need. We need more of this. Not just in here. We need this in here. When we're seeking the Lord, this is where we go. Psalm 138, 2, what does it tell us? God says, I have magnified my word above my name. Folks, if you're not in the Word of God, I want to encourage you. You will never regret spent time in your Bible. So notice, David, instead of just saying, all right, saddle up, boys. We're going to go rescue our family. What does he first do? He seeks God's will. He seeks God's guidance. And God tells David, I'm going to deliver them into your hands, and you're going to recover everything. Verse 9 and 10. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those who stayed who were left behind. But David pursued, he and 400 men, look carefully at verse 10, for 200 stayed behind who were so weary that they could not cross the brook Bezor. This makes me wonder. How weary, how tired, how depressed, how dejected do you have to be knowing that the enemy has stolen your family and you're too tired to go rescue them? Think about that for a moment. I don't think we can fully grasp the gravity of this scene. There's an old quote that I still love because it's applicable for all of us is that fatigue makes cowards of us all, doesn't it? Hey, just go a day without sleep and your best laid plans suddenly don't seem so great. David loses one third of his soldiers. And this could have been devastating to David, couldn't it? He's going to be fighting an already larger, vastly superior Amalekite army. Then all of a sudden, one third of his troops say, you got to go ahead without us. We can't make it. But notice, This is critical. We just read that God promised David victory, right? Are you with me on that? God said you will recover what? All. But now David loses a third of his army. See, God did not promise David that there wouldn't be further trials, did he? Sometimes we think that. All right, God gave me this word. It's go time. And then this trial pops up. We're like, what's happening? Did I mess it up? No. It's used to refine us and strengthen us and mold us and shape us into his image. Verse 11 through 12, watch what happens. Then they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David. And they gave him bread and he ate and they let him drink water. So they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. So when he had eaten, his strength came back to him. For he had eaten no bread nor drunk water for three days and three nights. Please don't let these verses pass you by. We can't gloss over these. What's David doing up to this moment? He's a soldier on a mission to save his family, right? He doesn't have time for a mission trip. He's got to rescue the wife and kids. But David comes across this Egyptian who's on the verge of death. And what does David do? He surrenders his priorities for a greater priority. This convicts me in so many ways. Because I'll tell you what I would have done. I would have done the drive-by deed. You see that guy just kind of throw a Twinkie out the window. Good luck, brother. I got to go. Not that I've ever done that a time or 20. Drop off some water. All right, get back to the task at hand. That's not what David does. And look how the Lord is going to provide through this. Look at verse 13. Then David said to him, to whom do you belong and where are you from? Pause here. Wait a second. David even takes time to carry on a conversation with a guy? Think about that. His wife and kids are captured. He doesn't know where they are. They could be anywhere, but he sees a man in need and David takes the time to care. Oh. How I need that heart. Look how verse 13 continues. And he said, I am a young man from Egypt, servant of an Amalekite. 
And my master left me behind because three days ago I fell sick. We made an invasion of the southern area of the Cherethites and the territory which belongs to Judah and of the southern area of Caleb. And look carefully. And we burned Ziklag with fire. Dun, dun, dun. Plot twist. This Egyptian was part of the troops that invaded David's hometown and took everybody captive. Let's read verse 15 through 20. And David said to him, Can you take me down to this troop? So he said, Swear to me by God that you will neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will take you down to this troop. And when he had brought him down, there they were spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil which they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from the land of Judah. Verse 17, then David attacked them from twilight until the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. Rosalind and, and uh, Ruby just rode camels, right? You know what that's like. So now when you read of somebody riding a camel and fleeting, you get it. Verse 18, so David res- recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, sons or daughters, spoils or anything which they had taken from them. David recovered all. Then David took all the flocks and herds they had driven before those other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. God's promise was fulfilled exactly as God said it would be, right? And notice, God fulfilled his promise, but he used David's actions to fulfill that promise. And this is the wonderful privilege we have as followers of Christ. Amen? Three of you. Okay. So listen, as Christians, God doesn't need us, does he? But he invites us to be a part of his work to do his will. Imagine that. The creator of the universe desires to use you and me for his purposes. What a privilege. Verse 21, now David came to the 200 men who had been so weary that they could not follow David, whom they also had made to, made to stay at the brook Bezor. So they went out to meet David and to meet the people who were with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. So imagine the scene, the 200 who were so weary, so dejected, so tired, so exhausted, so whatever, that they couldn't make it to battle. They see David and the 400 coming with all the people who are rescued. Can you imagine the jubilation, the celebration, the, oh my gosh, they're coming home? But you know, as well as I do, if you've spent any time walking with the Lord, that after every victorious battle, what then happens? Opposition arises, doesn't it? Verse 22. Then all the wicked and worthless men of those who went with David, remember David had a gnarly group of guys, right? Answered and said, because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead them away and depart. So some of the men who went and fought with David said, hey, those 200 guys were on a siesta. They didn't have to draw their sword. They didn't have to fight. They shouldn't share in the spoil. We're the ones that did all the work, not those guys. Verse 23 through 25. But David said, my brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given us. Notice who gave it? The Lord who has preserved us and delivered into our hand the troop that came against us. For who will heed you in this matter? But as his part is who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays by the supplies. You may want to underline this. They shall share alike. So it was, verse 25, from that day forward, he made it a statue and an ordinance for Israel to this day. The supply lines are just as vital as the soldiers on the front lines, and God will reward both. Thinking about that, even for our fellowship, Calvary Chapel, Cincinnati, we have many folks who serve in invisible ways. They serve behind the scenes. 
supporting the much more visible work that our fellowship does. Think about it for a moment. None of you found half-eaten cupcakes in your chairs, did you? You didn't find a bunch of food crumbs and Doritos. You didn't even find toenail clippings. That's a thing. Somebody was doing that for several weeks. We're picking up toenail clippings in the pews. That happens. If that was you, thanks for not doing it. It's been clean for like six months, so praise the Lord. A little weird. When you walked in this morning, you didn't find beer bottles, did you, out in the parking lot? Oh, but they're there. See, we have invisible servants who work behind the scenes to take, take care of all those things. And God will bless them just as much as he will a person who's up front with a microphone. You know, I was in the hospital recently visiting someone who was very sick. And they said that they could really just imagine that they were out there with me. They wish that they would, he said it, be there on the front lines fighting the battles for the Lord. See, he was too weak. He was too sick. He was hooked up to too many machines to even leave his hospital room. But you know what? He was right there on the front lines, wasn't he? As he went to the Lord in prayer. Never forget, the most important parts of the human body are hidden, aren't they? I can survive without an eye, but I can't survive without a stomach, or a brain, or lungs, or a liver, or a pancreas. Those are all hidden, aren't they? And the body cannot survive without those hidden members. And so it is with the body of Christ, as we see that in 1 Corinthians 12. Oftentimes, the hidden members of Christ are so often overlooked, but they are a necessity to the health of the body. Just because someone has a microphone or someone has a following does not mean that that person is any more spiritual than you may be. Because that person has the same Holy Spirit who indwells you as a believer. And never think for any minute that you're somehow a second-rate Christian. Amen? Verse 26 through 31, David now begins to make some political amends. Verse 26, Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, Here is a present for you from the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. To those who are in Bethel, those who are in Ramoth of the south, those who are in Jatir, those who are in Erer, those who are in Sifmoth, those who are in Eshtoma, those who are in Rakal, those who are in the cities of the Jeharimites, I brutal that, but you get it, who are in the cities of the Kenites, those who are in the Horma, those who are in Chorishan, those who are in Atak, those who are in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men were accustomed, look at to rove. See, these were the areas where David had done some of his bandit work. David's no political dummy. He knows that his time among the Philistines strained his relationships with God's people. So what does he do? He makes restitution. He makes things right. He says, here's spoil from the war. He sends it to 13 different cities. And this is really the final step of David getting right after his disastrous time. This is the last you read of David in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 31, the scene now shifts. So picture where we are. David backslidden, rebellious against the Lord. What has David done? He's repented, hasn't he? He's gotten right with God. Chapter 31 now looks at King Saul, and we look at King Saul's bitter end. Remember, at this point, King Saul has fallen into such a crazy place. Remember, he sought the witch at Endor. He's been trying to kill his own son, Jonathan, trying to kill David. He's a lunatic. And last time in our study, three weeks ago, we learned that the prophet Samuel said to Saul, tomorrow you and your sons will die. Chapter 31 is that very next day. Chapter 31, verse 1. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Gilboa. If you come to Israel with us, we take you right here to Mount Gilboa. Gilboa was the headquarters of the Israeli army camp. And as you read verse 1, what this tells us is Israel was so defeated, the Philistines have now slaughtered the Israelites in their very own home base. Verse 2, Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons. And the Philistines killed Jonathan, 
Abinadab, and Melchishua, Saul's sons. If you've been with us through the study, you've seen the exploits of Jonathan, David's best friend, faithful servant of the Lord. Jonathan is now dead, fulfilling Samuel's prophecy. Verse 3 through 4. The battle became fierce against Saul. The archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. By the way, this is where the phrase falling on a sword comes from. So picture the scene. King Saul struck by arrows. We don't know how many. Is it two? Is it five? We don't know. But now he's critically, mortally wounded. And he's afraid. Afraid of what? He's afraid that the Philistines are going to capture him. Because do you remember at the end of the book of Judges, what did the Philistines do to Samson? Remember they plucked out Samson's eyes and paraded him around like he was some circus freak? Saul is fearful that the Philistines are going to do the same to him. So he tells his armor bearer, just end it for me. Just kill me. The armor bearer won't. He's like, I'm not going to kill the king. So what does Saul do? He falls on his own sword. Verse 5 and 6. And when his armor bearer saw that, excuse me, saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men died together that same day. Again, fulfilling the prophecy of Samuel. Now, it's important to remember that originally, the books of 1 and 2 Samuel were one complete book. On Wednesday nights right now, we're going through the book of 2 Samuel. If you're not able to come, I encourage you to just follow along with us online and join us. Because a few weeks ago, we studied in 2 Samuel how an Amalekite said that he was the one that killed Saul. Do you remember that? But here we read that Saul fell on a sword, but the Amalekite says that he killed him. So which was it? Well, we study this, and you can listen to that study or watch it, but basically we don't know. It could be that the Amalekite was making up the story as he reported it to David, hoping that David would reward him. Or perhaps Saul fell on a sword, he was still alive, still breathing, and the Amalekite then came along and lopped him off. We don't know for sure. Verse 7. And when the men of Israel who were on the other side of the valley and those who were on the other side of the Jordan saw that the men of Israel had fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, you may want to underline, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. Please look what's happened. Saul's sin, his rebellion, and his lack of repentance affected much more than just him, didn't it? It literally endangered the entire nation of Israel. See, the Israelites, when they see the death of Saul, they panic, and now the Philistines make their way across the Jordan River and now dwell in the land that God had given Israel. At this moment, this is the deepest encroachment that the Philistines ever had in the nation of Israel. Verse 8 through 10. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. And they cut off Saul's head and stripped off his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim it in the temple of their idols and among their people. Then they put his armor in the temple of the Asherah, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bet Shean. Now, in those days, remember, trophies of war were often placed in conquering nations as a tribute to their gods. Remember when the Philistines captured the ark? What did they do? They brought it in the temple of Dagon. We studied that several weeks ago. David even did the same thing. Remember, he had Goliath's sword in the tabernacle at Nob. So here the Philistines chop off Saul's head and they hang his body on a wall at Bet Shean as a symbol of disgrace to Israel and as a sign of their own victory. 
And make no mistake, this is the ultimate insult. To have a dead body treated this way in those days, in that culture, was a fate worse than death itself. Our group in Israel was just here at Bet Shean a few days ago. We don't have the pictures, do we? We just crashed. That's too bad. But you can Google it, Bet Shean. And we toured the, the Roman city that crumbled in an earthquake. But we take it to the top of that very hill. And it was at the top of that hill where Saul's body was hung. Let's finish the chapter, verse 11 through 13. Now when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and traveled all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan, and they came to Jabesh and burned them there. This is the first cremation in the Bible, if you're wondering. Verse 13. Then they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. The men of Jabesh Gilead could not bear the disgrace and humiliation of what happened to the king. So one night they sneak in and they take Saul and his son's bodies off the wall. But we know Saul had kind of been off the wall for a long time, hadn't he? Why the residents of Jabesh Gilead? I'm glad you asked. You may want to jot down chapter 11. Remember, Saul rescued the citizens of Jabesh Gilead from the Amorat excuse me, from the Ammonites, back when Saul was still being obedient to God in chapter 11. This is a very bitter end, but almost an appropriate end for Saul, wasn't it? Saul was a man who tried to maintain his image at all costs, and he ends up as a public spectacle for all throughout history. As someone who started very well, and finished terribly. You remember Saul essentially wrote his own epitaph. What did he say? I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. So at this moment, chapter 30 begins with two men who began their walks with the Lord and had fallen away, David and Saul. But there's a world of difference, isn't there? David repented and got right with the Lord. Amen? Amen. Saul refused. He refused to get right with God. And his life turns into an absolute disaster and shambles. Folks, God in his mercy will give us chance after chance after chance to repent and get right with him. He's wonderful like that. But there does come a time when that person will not have an opportunity to repent anymore. I don't know where you're at with the Lord this morning. Maybe there's something he's been pointing out to you that says, hey, that secret sin no one else knows about, you need to repent of that. I don't know, but the Lord does, and you do. He's not a vengeful God. He's not trying to smush you down with his finger. He's not trying to hurt you. He's not trying to harm you. No, he loves you. And he has a plan for you and a plan for your life. And just as Jesus cried over Jerusalem and said, I wish I could cover you like a hen guards her eggs or her chicks, that's what the Lord wants to do for us. But you know what the problem is? Is we're sinners, aren't we? And we think our way is better than God's way. I want to encourage you, if you've been trying to do things your own way this morning, just stop and repent and relent and surrender, and say, Lord, I'm yours. What do you have for me? I want to invite the worship team up as we close. Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me? Lord, as we've seen through this study of 1 Samuel, King Saul had so much promise. He started off so well. But because of his sin and his lack of repentance, he did not finish well. Lord, that can easily be any one of us in this room right now. If we are unwilling to get right with you, we will not finish well for the race that you have set before us. So, Lord, we ask that you would search our hearts at this very moment. If there is something that is in our lives that is displeasing to you, maybe we're watching something that you're convicting us of, we're listening to things we should not be listening to, we are, Lord, we're we're your children but we're so rebellious sometimes. 
without realizing it, we can be much more like Saul than we can David. So Lord, we ask that you'd reveal those things in our lives. And Lord, that we would repent of them right now and say, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm all in. I'm fully yours. For your glory, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.